In the beginning, there was nothing. And out of nothing became fire and ice and cold. They came together. When they came together, the cosmos was formed. And in this cosmos came two people, two brothers, twins, and they were called Manus and Yimor. And with them as well was a giant cow, bovine. Manus and Yimo and this bovine floated through the cosmos, through time, and as time passed, gods were created, and some good, some chaotic, and all was good. But then what happened is an unspeakable act almost. Under the cover of darkness, a three-headed serpent known as Ingwi came along. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Today I'm joined by John F. White from the YouTube channel, Crekenford. And, uh, dude, your channel, I've been watching it lately, and it's just so in-depth with studies of ancient Proto-Indo-European, ancient Norse myths, Odin, the Sky Father, all that good stuff. So everybody go and subscribe, check that out. Get on that. It's just a huge tool and resource for knowledge. And uh, thank you for all that, all the work that you do. Thank you. And thanks for coming on today as well. So let's jump right into it. Uh, let me ask you this. The creation myths are very specific on some things. It seems like in the Bible, you got, you know, you got the Garden of Eden and the trees and you got the creation myths in Greece. You got creation myths in Europe. You got creation myths all the way to India in the Vedic text. The, uh, the uh, what do you say? The Rig Veda. Rig Veda, yes, yes. And I'm wondering if you noticed a common denominator or some, some sort of common thread within these myths. That's a good question. So... Yes, there is. Um, I didn't recognize it. There, there are many great scholars who come before me who have recognized it, but certainly the old Norse myths, so the Viking type myths, uh, the creation myth links to the uh, Roman myth of Romulus Remus, which can link to the uh, Indian myth of Rig Veda, like the Perusa hymn, which can link to Genesis and the uh, Enuma Elish. There, there are many connections here. And the reason we know these are all similar is because of not only similarities in story, but they actually use similar names. So, so you often see the same name appear in all these stories, as well as the same types of characters. And therefore, it is literally beyond doubt that these all originated from a single source. And that single source we call the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And the Proto-Indo-Europeans are a people who spoke a language called Proto-Indo-European, which means hypothetical. Indo-European, and the reason it's hypothetical is because we have no actual tangible record of that language, but we just see traces of languages that have evolved from it. And if we push all those languages back, we can see they come from a single source, and that single source mm -hmm. is where that creation myth started. Uh, and equally, it is also where we see the development of such technologies as horse riding and the wheel. And so this proto-Indo-European peoples and the technology and the stories uh, were quite advanced for the time and that allowed them to spread rapidly along with some sort of techniques they used in farming which is pretty much around the cow and using that rather than just doing agricultural farming and that literally allowed them to spread from northwestern Europe all the way down into the Vedic uh, regions of India. Wow, wow that's interesting. So that is fascinating. So now you can see, and I showed a map on the screen while you were saying that, of the migration paths from this region around the Black Sea. 
mm-hmm. where they're, they're going into India, they're going into Sumer, going into Greece. And it sort of spreads around the language, this, this Proto-Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European language. You can see the common, like, uh, for example, the word potter is pitar or oh, father yeah. in English. So you could see how this word, and I think mata or mati or something is mother, but you yep. can see how it's like pa and ma. Like you get that, yeah. So we even they call our, yeah, yeah. We even call well. our parents papa and mama. Like that's just like that's so old. People don't even realize how old that is. Indeed, they're not the oldest words we know, but they are pretty old. Pretty old, right? Pretty old. So oh. about eight thousand years is probably the limit of the age of that. And so with these. With these creation myths, what, do you think you is there any like common themes like the the tree the the I know they got the tree of knowledge and then I think and there's another myth where there's another tree somewhere. What is, what is that about? Um, so trees are probably a, a little bit more advanced. The basic creation myth. Well, I can tell you the Proto-Indo-European creation myth, and from that you'll you'll hear there's a number of themes in a story. Proto-Indo-European creation myth goes something like this. In the beginning, there was nothing. And out of nothing became fire and ice, heat and cold. And they came together. When they came together, the cosmos was formed. And in this cosmos came two people, two brothers, twins, and they were called Manus and Yimor. And with them as well was a giant cow, bovine. Manus and Yimo and this bovine floated through the cosmos through time and as time passed gods were created and some good some chaotic and eventually Manus and Yemo were fed up of floating through the cosmos and they decided they needed a home and Yemo said to Manus he would sacrifice himself for that so Manus in effect killed Yemo and used his body parts to create the world but not all of them um, there was a bit left over and a bit left over he he created a you Yemo, a king of this world and then with a bit left over from the legs he created the common people with a bit left over the body he created warriors and with the bit left over from Yemo's head he created the priests and then Manus came to the world to teach the priests how to perform ritual sacrifice um, and to make the gods happy and all was good but then what happened is an un speak relax almost under the cover of darkness a three-headed serpent known as Inwi came along and it stole the people's cattle it stole the cattle from these proto-indo-europeans and they couldn't have that so the warrior he made a sacrifice in liberations of soma like a, a, a drink to the warrior god um sometimes a storm god nowadays and said, give me strength. And the warrior god was thankful for the sacrifice, gave this warrior strength. And this warrior was called Trito. And Trito went off. Uh, he fought this three-headed, six-eyed serpent, collected the cattle and brought them home. And then the ca- ca- some cattle were sacrificed to the gods and the gods were happy and everybody lived happily ever after. Wow. And that is the basic gist. But from there, there are probably... 10 huge themes which carried on existing in multiple religions um and i can can briefly touch on them and then you can say where do you want to go okay so we've got the twins of creation manis and yemo and you see twins elsewhere such as romulus and remus we have the building of the world from body parts you see that in the new release to yeah yeah uh, and other places like that in the old norse myths um the class of people um, so the classes of people exist in Vedic culture as well as other cultures. So a commoner, a warrior, and a priest, and a king. Um, and so, and they link it to the divine twins and, and other aspects. Then uh, you also have the uh, nature of sacrifice appearing. So people understood about sacrificing to the gods to give the gods strength. The gods then will give you help. And then you have what I quite like to find interesting is the myth of Trito um, and the warrior. And that myth turned into the um, prince rescuing a queen or a princess from a dragon, or a knight rescuing a, a princess from a dragon myth. Um, and so, so they're, they're, they're sort of 
key myths in a, in a nutshell that have come out of that. Yeah, you can see these archetypes that get passed down to different cultures and they're used similarly, but change in a certain way to adapt to whatever culture they're in. And you get reflexes as well. So you get almost opposite myths and that happens in Christianity. So, so uh, one of the big themes and one of the principal beliefs of the Indo-Europeans was that um, the cosmos created man and man then creates the cosmos. So um, from, uh, so where Yemo sacrificed his skulls used to make the heavens and his brain, the clouds and his flesh, the soil, his blood, the water, and those aspects. Uh, and you see this in other cultures, yeah, you've got great examples elsewhere, but then um, when you die, your flesh turns, um, or, or, or you know, your, your flesh turns into earth and you know, um, your blood turns into water. But then when you're born, it's assumed that that material comes from the cosmos into the woman to, to be born. So therefore you sometimes have to sacrifice to replenish the cosmos with material so you can be reborn. Now that is something that pops up a lot in Hindu mythology, where the Hindus talk about, you know, Brahma creates the world and he uses exactly. Shiva, he turns Shiva, or I think it's Shiva, one of the gods into one of the the, the, the river. Ga no, it's the, actually the god Ganja. Ganja. Yes, for the Ganges, yeah. yeah, so Ganji, the Ganges is actually a deity, which is the water, and they they say they say the same thing when people die, you go into the earth and you reincarnate into something else, and you're just like this part of this giant network of life exactly. which, but, yeah. You, yeah you see this in christianity too so the book of uh, enoch the second book of enoch has an example in uh, the dove king or the dove poem um which is going back 2000 years old has this in where adam's built from parts of the world and the universe and, and literally lists these these items and so there's right. probably at 10 different major books from different religions you can look at and they all build man the same way Using yeah. the same, so the sun's always the eye, and the moon's always the other eye, and the clouds and brain, the flesh is the earth, and the blood is the water, the bones are stones. So it's a really common theme that has persisted. And and then I think I think it's also we should also point out that the religions that didn't survive, like the oh. hermetic the hermetic religion, talks about the 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 moon is the mother and the father is the sun. And, uh, okay, yeah, that's a little older. So yeah, I think the roots of those. So um. Yeah, so what happened is, uh, in terms of human evolution, and certainly the Europeans, um, is there was a, a, the world was going through the Paleolithic, and then um, as it hit the Neolithic, there was this big catastrophe of the world. This is often called the Younger Dryas event, where the world, or, or parts of the world, suddenly got really cold for about a thousand years, and then heated up again, and that caused lots of flooding and, and climate issues, and that had a real impact on human population. And it was after that we recovered from that, that we start seeing what we call the PPNA. So the pre-pottery Neolithic people uh, appear at the tip of the present, uh, the, um, so like North Israel or Southeast Turkey. So Anatolia, that's where farming starts. And that's where we get the early European farmers. And that's where like, some religion starts and then you start seeing Quebecki Tepe and places like that appear. And then it's just a couple of thousand years after that, that the protein to Europeans start coming along, but it, it takes them another couple of thousand years to actually um, advance in technology that they become the dominant culture really across Europe and into India. So the Hittites, for example, they are in a, in a location where if you look at uh, Hesiod, Hesiod's early Greek mythology, they think that he might go back before home or, or maybe vice versa. They, they don't really know, but either way, there, there's some uh, scholars who think that Hesiod is borrowing from some Hittite Hurrian earlier myths that go back another generation. And mm -hmm. uh, this would be sort of like a proto Indo European culture in a way. Yes. Um, so we believe, yeah, Hittite language certainly evolved from uh, proto Indo European language. That's our belief. But it then died out. Yeah, so, so that culture eventually stopped. And, it, and so there's three main culture types. I think uh, it was um, Germanic, Celtic, and what came to be sort of a, a mix of, of like the Baltic Slavic languages. Yeah. So do you think that when you see like a language like Etruscan, when I look at Etruscan, it mm -hmm. looks like Proto-Indo-European 
red letters. Do you think so? Or no, that no. So um, I, I remember you, you you showed me an example, but that, that's really a hypothetical example. It, what it's trying to get across is that early writing was very phonetic. Like the letters were sounds, um, right, as opposed to could be multiple sounds. Each letter had a specific sound, and so you spoke in sounds mm. rather than um, phonetic. Oh, sorry, yeah, rather than like sounds and hours we teach children today. Um, so yeah, that was just a hypothetical example. I mean, the writings are, are, you know, are nowhere near as old as the language itself. So there is, we have no examples of Proto-Indo-European language. Directly. That's a good point. That's a good point. The writing, because what we get passed down is we get the language being passed down as actual words, but the, <laughs> the, 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 the alphabet that the Phoenicians come up with sort of gets it's like a, I don't know if you want to say it's like a, a, a round peg going into a square hole, but it's sort of like the two get, get hit together. And so you got people speaking certain languages, but adopting an alphabet. And then eventually you get these new languages because of that. Exactly. So the alphabet evolution is quite interesting. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but it's, it's often considered that alphabets were borrowed from traders. So traders go through um, cultures that have an alphabet and then take that to a place that it hasn't and then sort of make up an alphabet based on what they saw for this new culture. And, and so, it, you know, that's why you certainly in, in Old Norse in the runes, you see some runes that look very Latin and some runes that don't. And it, it, it really feels like someone's borrowed an alphabet and sort of made it up for the Old Norse. You know, and then it's sort of stuck. Uh, yeah. yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. That's fascinating. And then it's because then you, you look at like the, 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 the his history of the Phoenicians and I, hmm. I actually, I want to get someone on that knows a lot about these Phoenicians because the Phoenicians are like, they I look at them as like, they are like the ones who bring everyone together in the ancient history because they're, they're traveling around the world. They're bringing their alphabet with them. They're trading with people. They're going all the way as far as Spain. Some people think they even went all the way to England. I don't know about that. But either regardless, they're all the way throughout the Mediterranean. They come from modern day Le Lebanon area, mm -hmm. but they're also trading with Babylonians on that side of the front. So like what you're seeing is you're seeing this like group of people who are becoming a force for connecting people in the world. Exactly. And, and you see that. Yeah. So we yeah. see that specifically where, where Indo-Europeans went down to say India and across to Europe, you actually then see that the Greeks go back to Persia quite a lot and start trading with Persia. And then the Persian evolution of the Indo-European myths then come back to the Greek cults to change them further. And so you see sort of a, a real mix of things happening. And that's why the Greek and sort of the, the religious myth, as opposed to sort of Romulus, Cerebus type myth, the ones of the gods, is quite different to the Proto-Indo-European myth, although you still see hints of what's going on, such as uh, rather than a uh, god is sacrificed, he's mutilated. So Kronos is, is um, castrated, I believe. So rather than killed. Which makes you, which makes you wonder, because by the time Alexander the Great comes around, by the time you get to the 4th century BC, the, we have a globalized world now. Cyrus the Great comes along, he globalizes. Cyrus does loads, yeah. Cyrus, yeah, he, gets, he should get more credit than Alexander, probably. But Alexander goes the other way in the other direction and the West becomes conquering the East. But either way, regardless that though that whole era sort of globalizes the world and it makes you wonder, makes me wonder actually, is these ancient myths, are they preserved in their entirety or are, is it like a game of telephone? Are they being influenced by outside entities and changed over time? What do you so, think? Yes, there's, there's a bit of that. And, and, that comes across in a number of ways. One, we know sort of the Egyptians had a lot of influence on um, the Abrahamic religion because you know Egypt was in, you know, responsible for that region when, when it started to develop. Um, and again, that would have influenced Babylonia or some awesome area. Uh, but we also see it when we actually discovered this Indo-European link that no one could work out why the old Norse myth was what it was. So, because the old Norse myth had in it um, sort of a god who was sacrificed um, to, to create the world, and Ymir, his name was, and Ymir is cognate with Yimo. So Manus means man, Yimo means twin, and Trito means third. So you've got this one, two, three sort of thing going on. But Ymir is in the Old Norse myth, that means twin. 
and we have Twisco. So Tacitus wrote about Twisco, which means twin as well in the Germanic. So you see this god is appearing there and Emir's sacrifice creates the world and there's a bovine and they couldn't work out why there is a bovine, but the bovine in the old Norse creation myth didn't do much. Really just licked a bit of ice and created the gods where in the uh, Indo-Iranian myths, the bovine is used to create animals and plants. And, and so there's, there's two key aspects of diversity, huge pieces of diversity in the Indo-European religious split. So that is one where we see uh, the bovine being used to create animals in Indo-European, uh, Indo-Iranian mythology. Uh, uh, it, in the European mythology, it's more of an agricultural bent. So they don't look at a cow in quite the same way. So, uh, the, and the reason they believe the cow is so exciting if you can call it that, um, certainly myth is that the cow is the perfect animal for farming. It, you yeah. use every part of it, you use its meat, you use its bones, you use its you know, urine, it's, it's milk, it, mushrooms. No yes, yeah, it was just, it's it just, yes, so useful. It had to be a gift from God. It's, it's you know, 100% useful. So that's why it was worshipped so much and thought to be the creation, the other thing of creation. Um, but it, it seems like the old Norse and, and Germanics didn't, Whilst the cow was important, it didn't quite have that same reverence. It was used to suck, used for milking, you know, a, a meat. But it, perhaps its other parts weren't used quite as extensively as it was in in the Iranian. But the other big change, just to flag this, because I want to talk about this later, is the creation of a soul. So in the European myths, no soul exists. In the Indo Iranian myths, a soul started to become uh, into existence. Wow. That's, this is all fascinating. So you mentioned about this cow, and I, and I, I read enough of the Vedic of the of the five Vedas mm -hmm. uh, to understand that they really venerate the cow as being holy. Exactly. And, That's like like, like like you said. There's so much you can get from the cow. It gives life. It 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 is like this. It, you, like it has all these different sources. You can make cheese. You can make exactly. milk. You can get meat from it, and then the. Uh, it makes you wonder if that soma from the Sima Veda, they talk about the soma juice being sacred. It makes you wonder if, there, if this is some sort of mushroom concoction. Or well, it, absolutely. It, it, without there it is. And so you see other versions that you see in, in Iranian myth or Persian mythology. You see it in Old Norse mythology. There's the Mead of Poetry. You see it mentioned in Greek as well. So I don't think so. There's definitely yeah, yeah. An, an alcoholic or, or a, 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 a beverage that walks the mind somewhat because it is that drink that um, allows Odin when he hangs from a tree to see the magic and the runes and he had to be to me he's under the influence of this drink the, the, what we call the mead of poetry but this summer um, and the story of the mead of poetry is an incredibly interesting one as well um, but yeah I think that's a common theme throughout um, our ancestors mythology that did have this drink do you know that story by yeah yeah the meat of poetry one yes yeah let's let's hear that real quick Just okay so my, yes, my, my audience loves this stuff go ahead so in the beginning well near the beginning of the creation of the old norse world um there was a battle between sort of gods and, and the, 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 the who seem to be like the bad guys you call them um without going too deep into mythology uh and they, they eventually decided to have peace uh, and by peace they um they they put sweat or I think it was or tears or something um, into a cup. So all, all the gods sort of sacrifice some some liquid into a cup. And out of that, a person was created called uh, Kasvira, I think his name was, um, which means to crush. And because he, he, because he contained extract of everybody, he was the cleverest man alive. Um, so, and then what happened is that the dwarves um, in Old Norse could they'd have that were these fancy type creatures, uh, the dwarves did, thought, oh, we could do something with, with, with Kasvir. So they basically kidnapped him uh, and used his blood to make some mead. And such that if you drank the mead, you'd be the most clever person in the world. And, and Odin thought, oh, I need some of this mead. So um, basically, uh, you know, I think the giant comes along and steals it um, and keeps, keeps it in, under a mountain with his daughter. And there's a whole story about how Odin tricks the giant uh, and gets into the mountain, has his way with the, the, the giant's daughter to get hold of the meat of poetry and flies it back to the gods. He turns it to the eagle and flies it back to the gods. And then just before he gets to the gods, 
the giant he stole it from was also turned into a bird to chase him uh sort of attacks him and he drops a little bit of meat of poetry uh and it lands on people and that's how we why we've got a little bit of intelligence and the rest of it he gave to the gods and that's why the gods are the cleverest people wow that's so th th these stories are so fascinating because you have to wonder how they it, how these uh details get thought about how they were influenced by whatever that was going on back then it's just so fascinating because it's such a long time ago i mean this is why I, I love this stuff so um i mean i i'm agnostic i guess i, I don't believe in god that there's I, you know, that Same sort of entity yeah. so um uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really into physics and, and and math and so i had this science brain on that you know god doesn't exist because science said you know doesn't prove God doesn't exist, but there's so much evidence to suggest. But then when I've started listening, like understanding these stories and you realize they're all man-made, you know, then, then there can't be a God because all, you know, all these stories are man-made. You know, I can show you that Genesis is, isn't, you know, from God, because it's actually ripping off the Enuma Elish, which rips off the Indo-Iranian myth, which rips off the Proto-Indo-European myth. And I can, we can go over that. Can, um, yeah, that's... But, what, but what actually gets me is, uh, in fact, let's, well, I'll tell you another story, the ferryman story. So uh, the ferryman of the dead, which people may see is like a, a grim reaper in a, a boat and he pushes a boat along with the water. Uh, and what his purpose was, was to deliver people who had died into the underworld or the other world. Now that story um, is actually, so there's a story about Orpheus in Greece where Orpheus, uh, his wife dies and he has to go into. Yours. To, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to get get his um. This is from Ovid's uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Great yeah, exactly. Story. I did a whole, that, I did a that, that book is basically Greek myth. If you, if you want to understand Greek myth, read that book. So, um, and she's died from a snake bite. Okay, so he goes in, uh, finds her. He's told not to look back at her as they leave. But just before he gets out, he looks back, and she goes and doesn't risk it, and he comes out. Um, very tragic. Very tragic. However. Would it surprise you that Native Americans have the same story? And uh, where there is a, and, wow. and this has been recorded, where you know a man loses his wife, he goes to the underworld, tries to rescue her, doesn't do it. And when he gets out, he is actually killed by a snake bite and ends up joining her. Now, if you think that, that story can only be in two places like that if it occurred before human mis humans migrated into the North American continent. So that's uh, over 20,000 years old. And if you think that, then you think, how, how do people back then tell the same stories across such a landmass for them to persist and, and, and spread? And that is, a, is an amazing fact. How do humans do that? And I have to, I have to jump in real quick because this I just thought of something that's okay. really profound. Ovid's Metamorphosis, like everyone knows, is written in the first century BC, I think, or maybe early AD. It's either like 14 AD or 14 BC, somewhere around in the time of Augustus. Now, this was considered one of the holiest books in the Roman imperial cult because this is the book that deifies Julius Caesar, it deifies Pythagoras, it deifies Asclepius, who becomes the healer god, becomes a prototype for the healer god. But Ovid, before this, that's the last book, that's book 18. The books leading up to that are what people describe as a retelling of ancient Greek mythology. So there, so you got like Jove, who is really Jupiter or oh, yeah. Zeus, but like he's retelling it to a new audience in the Latin language. So what does this tell you? This tells you that these are oral traditions being passed down that are held as okay. sacred. These have to be retold. These exactly. have to be brought back into the society that we're in right now. So it tells you that this could go back farther than we actually think. Yeah, and longer. I mean, I mean, tr over twenty thousand years. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's amazing. It is, and that's not. It's not the oldest story. You know, the oldest story knows about forty thousand years old. What's that one? So that oh, you want to know that one? So, um, <laughs> so the basic gist goes. Um, one day, a group of hunters and families were around a fire. Um, talking about hunting uh, and, and they're telling a story and the story was about a elk who um, came out of a cave of hibernation in the spring and the hunters were, were hungry so they chased it 
and they ran into the mountains and caught the sun in its antlers. And it was running away with the sun and the hunters were chasing it all across the year. Over the course of the year, they were chasing it and the sun was moving and moving and moving. And eventually, uh, come the winter, they managed to kill this elk. The elk laid on the ground right, and, and uh, the sun was released and the sun came back up for the next year. And in the next year, also, um, the, the elk had offspring during the year and it came out of its cave out of hibernation and the cycle started again. So, and we know this is the eldest story. And well, it isn't quite it. There's versions of it. And we know that because the same story, so this is told in sort of Germany and then Scandinavia, there's a version told in Spain with a deer rather than an elk. But wow. there's also a version told in Siberia, which uses a mammoth rather than an elk. Wow. And the same story is told in the North American continent uh, by Native Americans and by certain Eskimo tribes. Same, same story. Well, the same sites, then they use different animals. So the um, Native Americans often use a bear. And when the bear is killed, uh, that covers the world in blood, which is why well, the trees go brown in autumn. Now, and the reason we know this is all the same story is because they all use the same stars in the sky to tell it. So they use the Big Dipper or the plow. Um, familiar with that, uh, and they actually use the same stars to represent the same characters in the story. And this because is they you, called this, this is how you get these equivalents: Mercury yeah. and uh, and Hermes. I mean, this is new. Obviously, this is more modern, but that's a, that's a good example of uh, deities that are equivalents. They're different deities, but they're equivalents in the sense that they're using the same uh, constellation or star or yeah. planet. To, to identify this character as. Exactly. This is what you're saying. This is happening in 40,000 years this is four, And we know it's 40,000 years ago. And this is the kicker, is because the Ursa Major, which represents the animal, okay? It, currently, if you look in the sky in winter, it's up in, in the sky above the Northern Hemisphere. It doesn't make sense. So the story is told, called, like, so the mammoth, for example, hides in a river in the winter, so it isn't killed. But the elk dies. So it's looking like the sun's hit the ground. Is what the story is talking about. But if you turn the Earth back forty thousand years on, on any astro astronomy program, like if you look at sort of a uh, planetarium program, Ursa Major was lower in on the horizon, and forty thousand years ago, the, it would have disappeared, or like it would have been hidden. And that's how you can use science to like date early these myths. And not only that, the fact that the Native Americans have this myth tells you right away. This is going back to before they crossed the land bridge. Exactly, exactly. You have to be at a certain date already. The Egyptian myths, we also know that certain gods got dethroned. Mm -hmm. Os Osiris and Set would take turns having the throne. And they identified that there is a star fixed in the north at Polaris that changes every once in a while with another star. So like every like certain thousand years. Yes, yeah, because it will. It they falls, take turns, yeah. yeah. So that's how they identify the, how old those myths are. And those myths go back really far. Um, I, I have so many questions. You've opened up so many avenues right now. I'm trying to think which word I wanted to go to first. I wanted to ask you about the the culture that has Gebekli Tepe. In the, okay. yeah. is, is there any evidence of this culture having similar mythology going on? Do you know no, about it, that? No, there, there isn't enough information yet for us to understand what was going on there. I mean, there are so many more sites than Gobekli Tepe in that area. There's, there's at least seven other sites, possibly eight. Uh, and, you know, we've only uncovered you know, a, a small part of Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, they, they so, stopped. Um, we, we are so they far stopped. away. Yeah. yeah. And I was, because the only, the only pictures I can find of the archaeology is a couple of, like, stones and pillars. And it looks like there's, like, some sort of constellation thing going on there i don't know if oh, you the imagery of, of animals and things yes so yeah. and people some people think it is constellations some are animals and animals often repeated in glebeki tip um but no no one knows for sure i mean a lot of this no a lot of the things i'm talking about no one knows for sure we're just using lots of circumstantial evidence together gives us a really good feeling that probably what we're saying is correct yeah. because no one wrote this down as you say it's all all tradition yeah, and, and there's there's some archaeology, some etymology, uh, so the study of words, I understand these words or origins that allows us to um, work these things out. Now, do you do you agree with the dating about being like around nine thousand, ten thousand BC? 
Yeah, it's, 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 it's sort of just after the PPLA. So after the younger Gyrus and early European farmers, then Glebecki Tep sort of pops up. That would make sense to me. You're right. And um, another thing I wanted to ask you about, going back a little bit, we're talking about the cow being sacred <laughs> to certain cultures. But if I'm not mistaken, there are certain cultures in the Proto-Indo-European subset that actually thought that the horse was more sacred than anything else. So, so eventually, yeah. So the cow was sacred to about probably 2000 BCE, I would say, maybe maybe a little bit earlier than that. Uh, but when the horse would start to be used for technology, you know, when technology came along with the wheel and the horse, and you could use that for war and for chariots, then all of a sudden the horse is the powerful animal. You know, everybody's used to the cow now. So now the horse, you've got a horse, you can win wars far more easily than if you don't. And that's how that got elevated. And then that's the birth of what we call the divine twins. So there are one set of, of gods or you know, deities within uh, the Indo-European myth called the divine twins, not to be confused with Romulus and Remus, but uh, I think it's Castor and Pollux from the you know, Greek, um, and you know, Hengist and Horsa in the Germanic. So these twins are quite interesting. So they, they actually are based on the Indo-European uh, class system. So one twin was representative of a warrior, and the other twin was representative of the commoner. And you actually see, even though everybody thinks they're the same, you'll see that one's always passive and one's quite aggressive. And very often one drops out, and the passive one drops out, and you're just left with the aggressive one. It's so it's so fascinating that you bring this up because Carl Jung <laughs> actually wrote about these two twins, but he's using Ovid's Metamorphosis. Castor, Castor and Pollux, yeah. and he's getting into the psychology between the two, like you're talking about the certain archetypal personalities within these two characters, and it's so fascinating because we we give we don't give enough credit to how smart people were in ancient times. They like we we look at ourselves as like oh we have all this technology look how great we are, but we're building off of the backs of the people before us. Like a camera, did, we didn't just, someone just didn't invent a camera overnight. It was a, there was different kinds of cameras that eventually got better and better and better and better to now <laughs> we can talk online. But the, this same intelligence capacity was around Absolutely. back then, but they were just applying it to different areas like mythology. Exactly. Well, they didn't have all these material distractions. So they were really interested in the world, the earth. So... Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that really fascinates me. That's the thing I can empathise with. So whilst I'm not religious, a part of me is really quite jealous that we don't really understand how they thought about the world before it became this commercial you know, marketplace you know, with all these material items. Because, because if you look at that myth compared to the Abrahamic myths, certainly the, the Christianity, um, that sort of shifts how religion is used and looked at in society compared to the more traditional religions. And it's those traditional religions, I think, have a far better understanding of how we really connected with the world. You know, it was it was our, we had to take care of the world and the world would take care of us, where now we, it, the world is assumed to be made for us and we don't have to worry about taking care of it. And I think that we've lost that. Yeah, it's sort of like, it sort of becomes more focused on the church, the priests, the giving giving your paying your tits and making sure you're saved your salvation yeah. matters whereas these ancient and these more ancient myths are about the agriculture the earth the cycles of of nature uh winter winter solstice the equinoxes the the moon cycles all this stuff play comes in it's all and cycles they, yeah give back take and give yeah. back and the relationship between your psychology and the psychology of the earth if you want to call it that is so fascinating. For example, I, I go back to Osiris a lot. Osiris is fascinating. They actually identified the growing of corn as the phallus of Osiris growing. And it's like, it sounds crazy and ridiculous, but it's so fascinating. That, that, yeah. That's how it got, like, if you're actually trying to interpret what God is, well, if it's something, if it's anything, if there's any sort of deistic quality of what God is, it's the, it's the nature. It's all of it. Everything. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. It, and it's funny because the farther back you go, it feels like the closer you get to some sort of real understanding of what this all is. What life really means, you know, 
on his own. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let me see that. So I did a little um, video uh, on the carving of uh, the Lion Man. I don't know if you're familiar with the Lion Man. It's, uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I've got a couple of them in the other room, unfortunately. I've, I'll show you. But that to me is the starting point where humans gain the cognitive ability we have today. So basically, before then, you know, a rock was a rock, and then a rock became a, a hammer, and then a rock became a bit of flint. And it stayed like that for a couple of hundred thousand years. Maybe we got the flint better. But then at the point of the Lion Man, you know, whilst there was sort of some jewelry being made and things like that, the Lion Man was actually a huge step in cognitive reasoning. And there are some papers on this where someone's taken not only a bone and think, I want to make it this imaginary creature I've got in my head, but then also create the tools out of the stones to make that imaginary creature come to life. And from that point of view, it is you know, just a phenomenal piece of, of culture. I don't know if you want to call it art or, you know, because we're not really too sure what it is, but, but right. um, this, this totem is probably the best word for it, you know, created. And that to me, that's when I think humans started to think in the capacity we do today. So for like yeah, we've had at least forty thousand years of thinking like we do. Yeah, and I, I, I bet you're right. I bet you're right. I bet, I bet you if you had some expert on the development of the brain, of the human brain, they'd probably point to this time period as like a spike in the capacity of our intelligence. And yes. like, there's probably yeah, I'm not sure why, whether it's genetic or evolutionary or a bit of both. But yeah, there are good papers out there about that. Yeah, I actually had on Erica Gutsick Gibbon. She has a good channel about evolution and stuff like that. And she pointed out that there was a, I don't know if she said it was that time, but there was a, a, a part, there was a time in history where it was like out of nowhere, pretty much humans just were like capacity just went through the roof. And uh, it's caused a lot of people to have different hypotheses on how this is. It's not really solved yet, but one of the examples is, uh, is from what's his name? Uh, can't remember his name uh the stone ape hypothesis oh terence mckenna uh, yeah, yeah. He, he thinks that apes uh got out of the trees and got got onto the ground because of climate change and started tinkering with new food sources and then started eating mushrooms and psychedelics and yeah, got the yeah, brain going. yeah i mean obviously it's really it's, you know we can't say for sure that's true or not probably it might, probably isn't but it's still like it's fascinating to see that the humans evolve into something that is like out of nowhere, it seems like they just like yeah. exploded in, in intellect. Exactly. Um, and it spread so quickly, you know, that, that reasoning. I mean, it, it took probably, uh, you know, 10,000 years or so for it to, to spread across, um, you know, Eurasia, I guess, and yeah, just in time for the migration into North American continent. But yeah, it was, um, I mean, if it had, if it happened, let's say 10,000 years later, Native American Indians may not be quite as advanced as they were. Because yeah. They may not have had that genetic change. And they are, they were very advanced. Like people they were, they were. So they were certainly part of, of, um, you know, th that genetic pool, which, cause I imagine there will be some genetic modifications going on in the brain to, to reflect that uh, changing cognitive, cognitive ability. Yeah. And you can see the, 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 the uh, similarities between like the shamans in mongolia and the native americans and sort of how they they're very connected to the earth cycles and, and agriculture and nature yep. which goes back to what we were just talking about mm -hmm. um but you know i want to turn i want to switch gears for a second and get into the deity because we're talking this is like the, okay let's go let's talk about the deity itself like for like the progression of like the sky father for example let's okay. start with that one what, what? Um, go ahead yeah so uh so we, we can't be sure what the proto european pantheon looked like okay so we don't know too many of the gods we can make some assumptions we know there was a sky father so there probably was an earth mother but the proto the europeans were very um male dominated very patriarchal so so a lot of their words were about men not about women uh, and described that way and uh, women were described as gifts in effect so yeah they were they were traded and bartered, you know, wow. get buy prices. So that's how the culture was. You know? At the end of the day, wow. you had to work hard to live. And, you know, there, there was an assumption that the woman couldn't farm or whatever. Yeah. But that's where we are. So we, we weren't too sure some of the things uh, going on 
on there. Uh, but the sky file itself, like Deus Putter, as you call him, um, yeah, you, you, you see that name cognate actually throughout Europe to oh, India, wow. all, all yeah. over. It changes a bit in Europe as the languages change. So Proto Germanic went to uh, Tiwaz, which went to Tia eventually. Um, but, but that's a good point because you could see that, that it goes in different paths. So you got Dias Pitar and then Juice Pitar, yeah, Zeus. Juice and, and, Zeus yeah. and then you got Dias Pitar in India. But you, like you said, it also goes in another direction to, to where you get what's the, what's the word you said? Uh, Tiwaz. Tiwaz. Tiwaz, yes. T I W A Z. Language, language is a funny thing, but go ahead. I mean, well, you get T T T U before that, but Tiwaz and, and then, yeah, go to Tier. So, but, and there is an old Norse god called Tier. And people do think that could be related to the Sky Father, although there's other th schools of thought thinking that Tyr could just actually mean sort of, sort of like God, a, you know, a generic term for God. Because there are other terms like that used in Old Norse where gods have these generic names like Lord um, rather than the, the name you actually call him is a personified name. So, um, but that's a, that's a whole different video. <laughs> um, oh, so, so, but we see, we see the spread of, of, of this absolutely you know, the sky father what's interesting is the uh, delivery of storm gods uh underneath that so storm gods are quite important and we certainly see that in, in europe but also in india um you, you'll get you'll get those um uh, what again the other interesting thing is the actual the change of the people or the characters and the, what they actually meant within the creation myth as well which we sort of must forget so um, the gods were not overly important to the Indo-Europeans. So people didn't worship gods like, say, the Abrahamic religions worship their god. You, know, you don't go to, to a temple every Sunday and, and sacrifice something. You went to there you know, every so often. What was important to the Indo-Europeans was the um, reaching the level of those gods. So... Um, you wanted to be the best warrior, for example. So, as, as, as a warrior like Trito, your your mission as a man was to be a warrior who could kill these three-headed serpents, who could rescue cattle from your enemies, um, and to eventually become immortal. And there's actually a poetic phrase the Proto-Indo-Europeans use uh, called "fame uh, does not decay." Um, and so you'll see that in, in some of the stories that fame does not decay. And that was their goal for immortality. They thought if they performed great deeds like Trito in their story, um, poems would be written about them forever. And those stories would be told for such as we've got stories about Sigurd in Old Norse or Achilles in Greek. Uh, you know, you, you, they wanted to be that person. And so it's more important them to, to let's say, be the best priest who did the best sacrifice perfectly um, or to be the best king, but um, yeah, but the gods themselves, they were only used when they were required, as opposed to having a regular um, sort of worship routine for them. And um, do you see a connection between the Sumerian Anu and the Sky Father? This fought like, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the word Anu in Sumerian actually means sky. Mm. So I so, wonder yeah, if the connection yeah, that's uh, what it's odd because th there's there's some changes in stories there. So, um, so Tiamat right, was actually a cow. Still, what he says, Tiamat, really? a, a and and yet, yes, you, you think it's a water serpent because of this story with Tiamat and uh, Apsu. Um, but actually, there is, uh, and that story is quite interesting because you've got these pair, this twin system of creatures which one is killed and the world is created very similar to the in the european creation myth right yeah, absolutely there but but is it in the european creation myth well there was a tablet discovered um Landsberger and wilson 1961 i wrote a paper on it and it was a fifth tablet of the new release and it was a slightly different version of the story and it talks about tiamat uh living in, in muddy grass having a tail like a cow having others and so you know we build a picture that Tiamat has actually you know has evolved from a cow form wow which connect which goes back to what we were talking about yeah. with this sacred cow thing exactly so wow. as you see so that's that must have indo-european influence in there somewhere and then we all know that 
the first couple of lines of Genesis, you know, verses one and two in chapter one, are literally a synopsis of the Enumerulish. Yep. So, and there, there you have that link. That the Hebrew word tachom is co is cognate with tiamat. Yes, exactly. To deep, the deep. Yeah. In the in the abyss, in the deep. Exactly. And they and talk the, about the wind over the water, which is the wind used to kill Tiamat of Marduk. If Marduk killed Tiamat, then is Marduk the sky father? Because he's taking that sort of, well, no, that wouldn't be true because Marduk would be more like sort of Atlas or something. It's, it's very, yeah, the, the myth has got changed. And we see that. Well, that's, a lot. The polemic. That's, that's what the polemic is. Yeah. It's not copying it, but it's, it's almost like, like you said, it's a responding to it in a way, changing it, important changes to say, this is what we are. We're not that. We're different. Exactly. We're better. It, yeah. And we see that. So Romulus and Remus of the Roman myth is exactly like that. So on first glance, it just looks like a myth. But actually, when you realize um, Romulus and Remus uh, are twins and they go to form the foundation of Rome, um, you, about you, uh, and then I think it's um, Remus is killed by Romulus when he jumps over the wall and there's a sort of blood sacrifice and Romulus then eventually gets turned into a god a bit later. You think, yeah, okay, it's like the Indo European creation myth, it's, some, it's not quite there. But actually, that version is by Livy, uh, written, I think, in the, the early part of the, the first uh, millennia. Yeah. So, uh, it, there actually are older versions of stories of Romulus and Remus, and it was called Remus and Romulus. And in those, um, Romulus is actually quartered by the Senate. Um, so, he's killed and chopped up into pieces for the creation of Rome. But wow. the story changed because that isn't a great place for, for a hero of Rome, is it? You don't want your hero of Rome being chopped up. So the story changes. And you actually see that uh, Romulus and Remus was actually, um, quite, I think it's called Val Valis, which means man. And so originally the, the story was Rome and man. And uh, Quo Valis became the god, Romulus is god, which means just two men, which is the twin. So therefore you, have, you can really uncover that the... Yeah. the that they forgot, they understood the primitive part of the myth, you know, the, the 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 plot, but they they lost, you know, the, the real meaning of the names. They just you know they, they, they adapted. So that's a really good example where you see in the European myth completely change in terms of characters and that. But you, you know, the root is still there. That makes it the root. Not only is the root still there, but the agricultural aspect of it's there too. Whereas using certain deities are dying or reborn or being used to create something mm -hmm. that's that right there to me is pretty clear where it, that there's a common thread there yeah yeah and so odin let's get into odin for the last okay. couple minutes okay odin seems to be the final product of this all all father this all this 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 sovereign lord basically and i got i guess thor is in different depending on which location you're in thor could be that guy too Right, if I'm not right. mistaken. No, well, okay. So, the, the, yeah, we could talk for days on this one. So, um, so the Thor is a sky god. So Thor could be the sky father. I mean, people think he's a thunder god. Yes, he's got a name called Thunder, and he's got a hammer about lightning. Um, but his role in society where everybody worships him, he's the most popular god in Old Norse. Um, so, so all the warriors worship Thor. Um, so, yeah, he, he could be linked to the Sky Father, and Thor's quite a new god as well. So, the, the original god um, of the storm from the Proto Indo Europeans was Perun or Perkinus, and we see this. So, they're actually uh, carving saying Zeus Perkinus um, in, in sort of Greek archaeological finds. So, Zeus, storm god. Um, so, we see Perkinus uh, evolve etymologically. And then it changes to Fjolgin, um in uh, sort of the Germanic times, probably maybe 500 BCE. Um, you, start, you see this change, and Fjolgin goes into uh, Anglo-Saxon and uh, the down towards Celtics a bit, and that changes to Tenerus. But Fjolgin then appears in Old Norse, so there is a god called Fjolgin, which would etymologically link you directly to the storm god of the Indo-Europeans. And Thor appears. So Thor. It's like a, isn't really the storm god because that's Fjolgin, although he, or it should be, but Fjolgin doesn't perform that well. So, so there's a bit of complication there. That means, you know, so where did Odin come from? You know, if Odin was a sky father, well, Odin has multiple 
sources of his origin really but he's, he's the prime one i like is from anatoly uh, anatoly lieberman who talks about it coming from the wild hunt so the wild so what we must remember is that the proto-indo-europeans didn't look at gods as personifications they, they were spirits and sometimes groups of spirits multiple spirits they, they, they um and and that sort of changed and evolved as christianity came along and other, other religions sort of started to create this imagery um and we, we can show this because uh, our germanic ancestors didn't have temples with images of the gods in they, 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 so if you went to an altar the altar would have a possession that the god may have owned but you never saw or rarely saw an image of the god they didn't have that sort of view to personify so um so odin uh, they actually thought it comes from the wild hunt because the Indo-European uh, leader of the wild hunt we called Wothu, or group of spirits is called a Wothu. And Wothu changed to Woth, which changed to Wothan, or, or, or Wothanaz, uh, which would have been about 2,000 years ago, which changes to Woden. Now, Woden, if, if, so etymologically, uh, Woden going to Odin is quite simple so germanic words that start with a w followed by a vowel tend to lose the w going to scandinavia so wolf turns to Ulf, so woden turns to odin but there is also an other in scandinavia which people also believe is a form of odin uh, and that combined with sort of woden up, up in scandinavia um so because he has these roots of coming from perhaps the world hunt coming from the germanic area He's also being compared to people like Mercury, but I don't think he necessarily evolved. Uh, he, he certainly didn't evolve from Mercury, but I do believe that Scandinavian warriors who were mercenaries for the Roman army may have influenced some of the aspects of the character of Woden or Odin. That yeah. That may influence, influence that a bit. And Herodotus in 450 BC says that the Germans and Celts, instead of worshiping Zeus, have mercury as their sovereign so he's and he might not be correct but what okay. it what that, what that does tell us is that people in greece or the hellenistic people they were identifying the norse god as being the same as mercury doesn't mean they're right but it's what they thought i say but the god wasn't wasn't personified like that so there must have been a exactly. visual aspect and that visual aspect was probably the raven or ravens exactly um, and we see that in some um inscriptions about ravens appearing alongside mercury in germany um, so so is because like tacitus didn't go to germany he would he would he's, he's sort of some some chap who'd gone off exploring come back and say well what did you see and, I, and it's easy to see something or explain something visual and they said oh, there, there's these ravens with this god that everybody worships oh who has ravens with us mercury must be the same thing and it's probably more likely that the raven is the core here not mercury or, or woden it, right. was, it was the raven that, that came out. and what did the raven represent and the raven used to be a scavenger before eventually turning into a more clairvoyant type uh, character you know i was i was and this is just me speculating here because I, if i'm not mistaken isn't odin identified as like being a god of wisdom uh in so in the old norse odin looks like he's taken over many many roles so he's got over 50 names odin so um yeah he, he, so he's got the wisdom because of the meter poetry so the meter poetry drinks that you know everything right. now the reason why i bring that up is because the word veda in the hindu roots is it means wisdom the word wisdom yeah. is obviously a cognate with vidham wisdom veda like you can see there's some sort of connection there uh but odin almost if it's woden with, do you think there's any connection between no, Woden? Not at all. No, no, it, it comes from Wothu, almost certainly. Right. And Othin also comes from Wothu, but it could also it also includes Othor. Um, and we can see some of that because of the old Norse creation myth. Um, so in the old Norse creation myth, they come up, um, so it's, uh, there, there's a number of versions of it, unfortunately. But there's one version, the one I like from the Poetic Edda, which is a book of poems. Uh, and it talks about, uh, Odin, Honir, and uh, Luther, uh, so three gods walking along and finding two logs on a beach and they turn them into people. And uh, Odin uh, uses Ond, 
um, to give breath, they say. And uh, Lothor gives Little Gotha for colour, and um, Honia gives Othor for poetry. And the question is, why does uh, Honia give Othor for poetry if Odin is the god of poetry, meaning Othor? Uh, why does he give Ond? And it turns out that um, this may have just been a mistranslation by the person who wrote the poem, but Ond could actually mean sort of violent movement which represents Odin's chaotic frenzy wild hunt leadership and then um so and then you go Othor could actually mean voice and Lithogotho could mean genitals and so with genitals voice and movement you have looking at the translation that way you have a better I guess set of properties to give to a log to make it human rather than breath color and poetry which actually really doesn't help a log become human at all so, so we, but by seeing these, we start seeing these connections on what these people actually were and their origins, and that again links uh, Odin to a more world hunty, crazy madman as his origin, and everything else is is supplemental as stories grow and influences come in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, that definitely clears that up. And I, <laughs> I, I think when I get you back on, I think when I have you back on, we want I want to get into this wild hunt thing. Yeah, okay, that's, a, that's a great it. story. Yeah, there's an I'm interesting not story. Mistaken, this is influences the game, The Witcher Three. Mm, there's so, something in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I know the guy who created that game is from. He has like a. He's into Slavic mythology. He's from. He's from Poland. And he's big into that stuff. So I wonder if he's. Uh, he's get borrowing a lot of these ideas from. Oh, yeah, there's lots of stuff. There's lots of world hunt stories and how it came about and. Yeah, so we can talk about that. Talk more about yeah. So we haven't, we've only really touched, haven't really touched on the creation myth proper, or, right? And, this and, is yeah, the tripartite system. Yeah, we're just barely touching the surface yeah, in this yeah. video right here. But but I just want to give you a feel. Of, yeah, of this is good, this is a good feel. To uh, I'm going to start a playlist for Norse mythology slash Proto Indo European stuff. Um, that what do, you, what do you think would be a proper title for this? Is it, is it Norse mythology or is it proto? Oh, well, it's, it's Indo-European comparative Indo mythology or well, mythology, Indo-European mythology. That's probably a good right. starting point. That sounds like it, that makes sense. Okay. And uh, let's let everyone know where they can go and find your stuff. Other than so I'm a quick and fooled. Yep. So it's uh, hopefully these words appear on your video. It is. Uh, I'm a quick and fooled. Please come along, watch. And if you'd like the videos, like them and subscribe. Um, try and get a video out every two to four weeks. And yeah, it's a very positive community. But for yeah. such a niche subject, it's it's doing quite well. Yeah, and links in the description, and I left the, and there's a comment uh, pinned as well. Click okay. on whatever link you want, subscribe, hit the bell, and you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.